It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. For years, foreign powers have fueled the Syrian war through airstrikes and their proxies on the ground. But now the threat of direct confrontation between them is growing. Russia has warned U.S. aircraft are potential targets after the U.S. downing of an Assad regime warplane. The U.S. said it was defending its allies from regime attacks. But it was the fourth time in less than a month that the U.S. has targeted Assad-allied forces. And that continued today when the U.S. military shot down an Iranian drone in southern Syria, the second time it's done so in just two weeks. So could the Syrian proxy war turn into a hot war? Well, to discuss, I spoke earlier to Ben Norton, a reporter for Alternet's Gray Zone Project. Welcome, Ben. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to have you on because... You and your colleagues at Alternet's Gray Zone Project and also Fair Media Watch have been consistently critical of how the Western media is covering the Syrian war. And that's especially important at a time like this when tensions between the U.S. and Russia are extremely high. And the U.S. appears to be ramping up its military operations targeted at Iran and its forces inside Syria. So on that note, let's talk about what's happening right now. Uh, you have, in the past few days, uh, the U.S. downing a Syrian warplane for the first time of this war. Uh, Russia saying in response that it now considers U.S.-led coalition warplanes a legitimate target. Uh, and then today, uh, you have the U.S. downing a uh, Iranian drone uh, for the second time, I believe, in, in about two weeks. So set the scene for us right now for what is happening between all these foreign players, these major foreign players inside Syria. When Trump entered office, uh, immediately the military and the U.S. military began ramping up uh, different forms of military escalation inside Syria. In April, uh, after the U.S. accused the Syrian government of using chemical weapons in Khan Shaykhun, which is uh, a town in Idlib, the Idlib province, which is controlled uh, essentially by rebranded al-Qaeda at this point. Um, and in that attack in April, the U.S. attacked a Syrian government air base known as Shayrat and destroyed about 20% of the Syrian government's aircraft, according to the Pentagon. Then in, on May 18th, the U.S. ramped it up a step further, and the U.S. began attacking Iranian-backed forces in southeast Syria near the border with Iraq. And I think a lot of our discussion today will be about what's going on in southeast Syria, because this is really the new site for a kind of, uh, you know, new phase in the war. And this area, it's called Atanth in the southeast, uh, is at the borders of Iraq and Syria, and it's also near the Jordanian border. Here, the U.S. has deployed uh, missiles that are called HIMARS, which, which is the first time they've been deployed inside Syria. And uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, says that these missiles are going to be used in self-defense. Uh, but the U.S., of course, has not declared war in Syria. Uh, the U.S. has never gotten any kind of congressional authorization to wage war in Syria. The U.S. is shooting down Syrian government planes and attacking uh, Syrian government allied forces. But it's not officially at war in this area. And it was not welcomed into this area. So things are really, really escalating out of control. And uh, when you look at even the kinds of people like Colin Cowell, uh, Colin Cowell was a former Obama administration top official on foreign policy who advised both President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden. And he recently wrote uh, on June 19th, uh, and I'll quote him here, I have some quotes. He said, quote, the risk of sliding into a big war is rising. And then he said, the two halves of the Syrian war are merging together. And by that, he means the western part of the country and the eastern part. The eastern part was largely controlled by ISIS. But now, as he said, and again, this is an Obama administration official. This is not some anti-war activist. He wrote, quote, the days of the ISIS campaign happening in strategically marginal parts of Syria are over. And then he also added, in perhaps the most worrying part of what he wrote, quote, that is the path to quagmire, a possible clash with Russia and the war with Iran, some in Trump's administration and outside think tanks want. So when you look at a lot of what's going on now, it, if you follow it to its logical conclusions, it could very well lead to a war with Iran and potentially even Russia. 
And anyone who's concerned about that really should be speaking out and, and raising concerns. So Ben, let's talk about what the uh, U.S. is claiming as justification for its uh, increased strikes against Syrian government forces and their allies, which is that um, they say that they're firing uh, because uh, Syrian forces or their allies are threatening U.S.-backed forces. You had that on May 18th in southern Syria when the U.S. bombed um, uh, some Syrian government positions and killed several soldiers and said that, uh, that Syrian forces were entering a deconfliction zone. So this rationale we hear that the U.S. is simply acting in self-defense of its allies. No, I mean, this is preposterous if you look at what's actually happening on the ground. First of all, as I mentioned, and it's important to underscore this, regardless of what you think about the Syrian government and the Russian government, Russia, their defense ministry released a statement after the U.S. downed the Syrian warplane near Raqqa, and Russia pointed out uncontroversially that what the U.S. is doing is, is violating international law. Again, regardless of what you think about these governments, the Syrian government is a U.N. member. They have representatives at the United Nations. And the U.S., which has not declared war in Syria, downed a Syrian government plane operating in Syrian territory. This should be very troubling. Again, regardless of what you think about these actors, this is a, a complete violation of foreign countries' sovereignty. Um, so that's, that's certainly part of it. And then there's the allegation that these forces are close to the U.S. Well, there are, a, there are degrees of hypocrisy here. First of all, let's look into the actual argument the U.S. is making. The Pentagon has said on May 18th, for instance, when the first attack began, that Iranian-backed Syrian government allied forces were approaching a U.S. base where it's training rebels in southeast Syria at Atan. And again, I mentioned that's the border crossing. It's also known as Al-Walid in Iraq. It's the border crossing between Iraq and Syria. The U.S. claimed that the Syrian government allied forces approached its uh, base where it's training rebels. And the U.S. cited something called a deconfliction zone. Now, uh, several months ago in Kazakhstan, in Astana, uh, Turkey, Russia, and Iran, uh, and of course Syria, uh, came to an agreement. Uh, the U.S. was not invited to these peace talks. But, these, but Syria, uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey came to an agreement. And part of their agreement um, to try to de-escalate the war in Syria was the creation of four deconfliction zones inside Syria. One of those deconfliction zones is in the southeast, near Atan. Well, the Pentagon explicitly said that it does not recognize this agreement. The U.S. does not recognize these de deconfliction zones. And, it's, and the Pentagon said that the U.S. is going to operate planes wherever it wants in Syria, ostensibly in order to fight ISIS. And this is the justification that the U.S. is using for a lot of this policy. And of course, it sounds great. I mean, no one wants ISIS to survive. That's horrific. But at the same time, it's being used to rationalize and to justify further actions and aggression against Iran and the Syrian government. So when we look at what the U.S. said on May 18th after the first attack, and this was the first of three attacks that the U.S. waged against Iranian-backed Syrian government allied forces in the southeast there, the U.S. claimed that these forces approached uh, its base inside the deconfliction zone. What, what it did not mention at that same time is that the U.S. has previously, as I said, not recognized or acknowledged the legitimacy of these deconfliction zones. So the U.S. is trying to have its cake and eat it, eat it too. It says, well, you've come too close to our base, even though reports said that at most, uh, or at, at the least rather, that these forces were 17 kilometers away from the U.S. base. 17 kilometers is not close. These are not forces that are actively attacking the U.S. These are forces that are allegedly approaching, maybe, the U.S. base 17 kilometers away, and the U.S. uses that as a justification to attack. So there are many things to unpack here. It's pretty disingenuous. And when you look at the inconsistency of the Pentagon, which again is making these decisions, it's Mattis and McMaster. Trump has no idea what's going on, and he's outsourced this policy. And right now, the policy is incredibly contradictory, and I would say in some ways very cynical. Uh, the Pentagon is not being honest about it, and it's clear that it has serious ulterior motives. And I think that primary ulterior motive 
is preventing the Syrian government and, and Iran from retaking this critically important border area so that the U.S. can, can maintain control over this area and prevent Iran from having a very important uh, land access there uh, straight from uh, Iran into Iraq, to Syria, and to Lebanon. That's the primary U.S. goal. Yeah, Ben, uh, just to say that uh, about this drone, this Iranian drone that the U.S. shot down today that I mentioned earlier, uh, in the U.S. statement announcing that, the language they use is that the drone was uh, approaching uh, on the U.S. position. Not that the drone was attacking the U.S. position, uh, it was approaching on the U.S. position, uh, which, which suggests that the U.S. might be using a very um, uh, wide definition of what approaching is for launching an attack. But let me ask you, on the point you just made, if it's true that uh, the U.S. is seeking to, uh, is, is aiming its military operations more and more in the direction of Syria and its ally, Iran, and it's true that Syria uh, and its ally, Iran, have been fighting ISIS, is it um, fair to say that the U.S. might be seeking a policy uh, that subordinates the fight against ISIS to the fight against Assad and Iran, ensuring that they don't take territory? Well, I'm glad you framed it that way. And I would say yes. If you frame it that way, then that's, I would say, incontestably true. And the irony is, not only is this an uncontroversial observation, it's an explicit policy that has been proposed by people like Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, who just a few weeks ago wrote a column in the U.S. newspaper of record arguing explicitly that the U.S. should stop attacking ISIS and allow ISIS to continue attacking and waging war against the Syrian government and its allies in order to weaken them. This is actually a policy that many people in the U.S. sphere of influence, if you will, have proposed for years. And it's actually probably the policy the U.S. government itself pursued. Uh, in 2016, John Kerry, um, in a kind of off-the-cusp uh, comment that was recorded by some uh, pro-rebel activists, acknowledged that the U.S., the Obama administration, uh, for a few years watched the rise of ISIS and other extremist groups and did very little um, and continued for, uh, arming rebel groups that were allied with these militias in order to weaken the Syrian government. And when we look at the policy today, I mean, the U.S., of course, as I said, wants to have its cake and eat it too. It does eventually want ISIS to be defeated, but it also wants Iran to not have influence in this critically important country in the middle of the Middle East. It does not want the Syrian government to be able to maintain uh, control over all of these areas that it has been trying to retake. It does not especially want Hezbollah, uh, the Lebanon-based militia that's backed by Iran and has been leading the fight against ISIS, to be able to further consolidate power. Uh, Israel has been supporting, uh, you know, a close U.S. ally, has been supporting rebels inside Syria as well. A Wall Street Journal article recently showed how uh, Israel has been funding and arming uh, numerous mil militias inside Syria. So when you look at what the policy is, it is very contradictory. And, and on this note, I'll actually, I'll mention one other thing that I got up to quote, because um, there have been uh, numerous mainstream outlets not even just the media, but even think tanks and, you know, academic institutions that have acknowledged what the U.S. is really doing. And one of the most interesting reports that I've seen is from the Carnegie Middle East Center, which is, again, a very pro-establishment, straight-laced think tank that's actually funded by the Pentagon. And they re released a report a few weeks ago that looks at the situation going on in Atanf in the southeast of Syria. And in the final paragraph, this person, this fellow at the Carnegie Middle East Center wrote, um, this is a very interesting passage, listen here, quote, until now, the Trump administration's statements about wanting to diminish Iran's role in Syria have been general. Events in the Southeast are adding substance to that commitment. However, given Iran's multiple alliances, the odds are against the U.S. Perhaps the greatest paradox, and here's the most important part, perhaps the greatest paradox one nobody in Washington will mention is that in the greater game between Iran and the U.S., the Americans do not want the Islamic State in Deir ez-Zor to be defeated by anyone but themselves, certainly not by Tehran's allies. So again, this is a Pentagon-funded think tank, very establishment think tank, acknowledging that at the end of the day, 
the U.S. does not want Syria and Iran to defeat ISIS. The U.S. wants it and its forces, namely the, backed, uh, the U.S.-backed SDF forces, to be the ones that defeat I ISIS in this area because the U.S. knows that if Iran has an ally, namely the Syrian government, that retakes this area from ISIS in the southeast, then Iran has a straight path from Iran into Iraq, from Baghdad to Ramadi, west into Atanf in Syria, and then west straight to Damascus. And the U.S. really wants to prevent Iran and, of course, the Syrian government, which is its ally, from having that straight line between Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. Syria and Lebanon, rather. Because at the end of the day, the U.S. does want ISIS to be defeated, but more importantly, it wants uh, Iran to be contained in this region. That was Ben Norton, a reporter for Alternet's Gray Zone Project. I'm Aaron Maté. Thanks for joining us on The Real News.